Hi there, and welcome to A Song of Ice and Fire Explained. Today we'll be summarizing the entirety of A Feast for Crows in preparation for the release of The Winds of Winter. We'll also point out some of the cool theories and conspiracies going on. Now, if you've only watched the TV series and not read the books, you might not know that the events in this book take place in King's Landing, Dawn, and the Iron Islands, while simultaneously the events in A Dance with Dragons take place in Essos and the North. So, let's begin with the prologue chapter of A Feast for Crows. Page sits with his fellow students Molanda, Alaris, Armin, and Rune at the Quill and Tankart in Old Town. He yearns for Rosie, the pretty daughter of a serving maid, a 15-year-old girl, whose maiden head can only be had for a gold coin. The other students discuss dragons, and whether they are still any in existence. Pate is waiting for an alchemist who promised to meet him there that evening. The alchemist has offered to change iron into gold, requesting that Pate steal a particular iron item in exchange for some gold, and said he would be back in three days to make the exchange. Molander and Armin continue their argument about dragons. Molander says that sailors' tales speak of dragons in Essos, often accompanied by a young queen. Alaris keeps splitting thrown apples with his arrows. After the last, he brings up the Targaryens, telling the others that Viserys Targaryen's sister, Daenerys, is still alive. Molander drunkenly toasts her, only to be shushed by Armin. Lazy Leo appears then. Molander bristles at his appearance. Armin asks him more diplomatically whether Leo wasn't confined to the Citadel for three more days, but Leo shrugs this off with a quip on the meaningless of time. He asks them to buy him a drink since he lost his money gambling and eating elsewhere. He offends them each in turn, then attempts to mollify them by confirming that Daenerys is alive and has hatched three dragons, as the tales come out of Quarth. Archmaester Marwyn even gives them credence. Leo says, Marwyn called the mage is widely considered unsound, partly because of his practice of speaking to small folk and other unwholesome people. After the others scoff, Leo adds that there is a dragon glass candle burning in Marwyn's chambers. The group breaks up after that, most of the students returning to the Citadel. Pate remains with Leo, hoping that the alchemist will still come by. Leo needles Pate a few times about Rosie. Pate wishes he could kill Leo, but Leo is a Tyrell, with relatives in positions of power. He sees the sun rising and realises that the night is over and the alchemist has not come. He leaves with a warning to Leo to leave Rosie alone, and wanders through Old Town in the early morning. The alchemist finds him and tells Pate that he didn't want to intrude on him and his friends. He has asked Pate to steal something from Archmaester Walgrave. Pate opened the box under Walgrave's bed and found an Archmaester's iron key, which supposedly opens every lock in the citadel. After wrestling with his conscience, he took it, as well as a sack of silver coins. He asks the alchemist for his gold dragon coin, and the alchemist bids him to follow him someplace more private. They go through several winding streets and end up in an alley. The alchemist gives Pate the coin, but the boy hesitates before offering up the key. He asks the alchemist's intentions, which he will not say, and asks to see his face, which is nondescript, but book readers suspect he is Jacqueline Higar. After giving the key to the alchemist, he turns away, feeling lightheaded and collapses, dead on the cobblestones a few moments later. Chapter 1 has Aaron Greyjoy, who in the chapter is referred to as the Prophet, drowning men at a beach on Great Wick. This is a practice in which a worshipper of the drowned god is held below the water until he drowns. The priest then resuscitates him using CPR. Through this initiation, the person is stronger. What is dead may never die, but rises again, harder and stronger. Gorman Goodbrother appears to bring Aaron to Lord Gorold Goodbrother. Aaron initially declines, but relents. When the messenger tells him the king, Aaron's brother, is dead. During the journey, Aaron remembers his brothers. His father married three times. The sons of his first wife died young. The eldest son from his second marriage was the strongest and fiercest of the remaining. Aaron admired Balon, although they were not close in their youth. When they arrive at Lord Goodbrother's Hall at Hammerhorn, Aaron demands that everyone in the hall be sent away so that he and Gorold Goodbrother can speak privately. Lord Goodbrother insists that his maester will stay as well, 
Aeron disagrees and prepares to leave, but the maester stops him by informing him that Euron Greyjoy has occupied the sea stone chair. Aeron is shocked. He remembers his brother, but with little love. Good brother wants advice on whom to support, but Aeron wants to pray first and leaves for Pebbleton. Again, Aeron thinks back to his youth. He was not a very religious man, but rather a drunken sod. This changed when he fell overboard in a sea battle during Balon's Rebellion. He almost drowned and became a devoted follower of the drowned god. Aeron has discussed the succession with Balon, though Balon wanted his daughter, Asha, to succeed him. Aeron did not agree with having a woman rule the Iron Islands. Theon is a weakling and probably dead. Balon's eldest brother, Euron, is ungodly and Aeron hates him. Thus, Aeron makes up his mind. It must be Victorian. A few days later, Aeron has arrived at Pebbleton and starts to preach. Asha has also claimed the throne. Now, Aeron's followers and a number of lords look to him for advice on whom to support. During his preaching, he finds his inspiration. The Iron Men should elect the king in a king's moot, as they did in the old days. Every captain is to go to Nagas Hill on Oldwick, the ancient place where the old kings were chosen. Aeron hears his followers take up his call and knows he has done the right thing. Chapter 2. Prince Doran has been living at the Water Gardens for nearly two years now, watching the children play in the pools while trying to deal with his gout. Captain Aereo Hotar hears the approach of Obara Sand, eldest of the Red Viper's bastard daughters and bars her from disturbing Prince Doran's rest. Deadly as she may be, she is no match for the captain, but the prince calls her into his presence before they come to blows. Obara demands justice for her father, imploring Prince Doran to marshal the Dornish army and give half to her so she might march on Old Town and burn it to the ground, and the other half to her half-sister, Lady Nim, to march up the King's Road. Doran tells her that his brother was not murdered, but died in single combat, and that Lord Tywin has promised them Sir Gregor's head. Unappeased, Obara mocks her uncle for his weakness, and stalks off after he tells her to await his word in Sunspear. Fearing an uprising in Sunspear, incited by the Sand Snakes, Prince Doran tells Hotar that he must return to his seat at the Palace of the Sun. The captain reminds him that Princess Marcella is there, and that Sir Eris Okart sends letter to Queen Cersei. Hotar thinks that he and the Kingsguard will eventually cross swords, and when that occurs, the captain will kill him. The next morning, the prince and his retinue begin their journey back to Sunspear, but along the way, they come upon another of the Sand Snakes. The beautiful Lady Nim is far more tactful than her older half-sister, but no less resolved to seek justice for her father. Scoffing at Obara's demand to go to war, Lady Nim tells her uncle that she needs only her sister, Tyene, and the two will assassinate Cersei, Jaime, Tywin, and King Tommen, stating that his brother was only to take the measure of Joffrey's court and not seek revenge for Elia, despite the 17 years that have passed. Nymeria responds in parting, My sisters and I shall not wait 10 and 7 years for our vengeance. Arriving in Sunspear, the prince's retinue is accosted by townspeople, calling for vengeance for the Red Viper. In the old palace, Princess Ariana greets her father and tells him that Tyene Sand awaits him in the throne room. The third of the Sand Snakes is embroidering when the captain encounters her while bearing Prince Doran to his high seat. Tyene offers her uncle the cloth she is knitting, which shows her father mounted on a sand steed, so that he will not forget Oberyn. Prince Doran responds, I am not like to forget your father. That is good to know. Many have wondered. Tyene counsels her uncle to wed his son Tristan to Marcilla now, and then crown the princess as is the Dornish way. This would incite the Queen Regent and Highgarden to march on Dawn, where the prince's armies could bleed them in the high passes and treacherous deserts. When she calls her uncle fearful, Doran advises her, there is a difference between fear and caution. Tyene raises her hand to touch her uncle, but Hotar brings the butt of his long axe down on the marble floor and cautions her. The Sand Snake replies that she meant no harm and loves her uncle. After she takes her leave, Maester Calliot rushes to the prince's side to make sure he was not pricked by one of Tyene's needles. 
Shortly after, Prince Doran commands Hotar to round up and confine all the Sand Snakes, including Alara's four young daughters. Obara, Nymeria, and Tyene are locked up in cells atop the Spear Tower, but with no blood spilt. The younger Sand Snakes are restricted together with their mother to the Water Gardens. When Hotar tells him that the common folk will howl when they find out, the Prince of Dawn replies, All Dawn will howl. I only pray Lord Tywin hears them, so he might know what a loyal friend he has in Sunspear. Chapter 3 Cersei dreams that she rules from the Iron Throne, and courtiers are playing her tribute. But the pleasant dream turns into a nightmare when Tyrion appears and ridicules her, making the great lords, proud ladies, and young knights snigger at her as well. She notices she is naked and hastily tries to cover up, but this makes her wound herself on the spikes and blades of the Iron Throne, and soon she is engulfed in a mortal combat with the throne that is trying to rip the flesh off her. She is woken up by her frightened maid, Sinel, with armed men who have arrived to deliver the news of Lord Tywin's murder. Cersei is still drowsy and believes this to be part of her nightmare and expects Tyrion to crawl from under her bed to laugh at her. She now recognises Jocelyn Swift, Sir Osmond Kettleback and Sir Boris Blunt and notices Lannister guards. She wonders whether the news can be true, insisting that her father is surrounded by guards day and night. So Osmond tells her the guards were on their posts, but a secret passage has been found behind a hearth in the Hand's Tower, and Jamie has gone in to inspect it. Cersei is worried about Jamie's safety as well as of Tommen's, but she is told that guards supervised by Sir Loras Tyrell have been assigned to watch over the king. This stirs up her resentment against the Tyrells, and she wonders whether the murder was their doing, yet does not dare to speak this aloud. She commands Sir Osmond to escort her to the Tower of the Hand, and Sir Boris to make certain that Tyrion is still in his cell. She doesn't believe Tyrion would dare raise a hand against their father, but needs to be certain. Outside, the sun is beginning to rise while the stars can still be seen, making Cersei think that the great star of the West has fallen. Sir Osmond tells her that Lum, one of the guards, found the body in the privy. She already feels the hole left by Lord Tywin, and decides to act swiftly as she suspects there will be attempts to push her aside, as always. She wonders whether Stannis Baratheon is behind the murder. She enters the tower and thinks that not crying makes her the only true son her father ever had. Climbing the many stairs to the Hand's chambers prompts her to think about tearing the tower down. As she enters the hall, she finds the room full of guards and servants, whispering among themselves. Cersei resents their presence and the fact that she was not called first. She orders Sir Mirren Trant to show the people out and is informed that her father's body has been brought to his bed. When she enters the bedchamber, guards are present again, as well as her distraught uncle Kevin, kneeling by the bed and trying to pray for his brother. She notices how small the door to the secret passage behind the hearth is, making her think of Tyrion again, then settling for Stannis or the Tyrells as more likely suspects. She knows about the rumours of secret passages in the Red Keep, and that Maegor the Cruel supposedly killed the builders of the castle to keep them secret. She thinks of other yet undiscovered secret passages to other bedchambers, and has a vision of Tyrion using one to get to Tommen. Cersei has a look at her father's half-naked body, while reflecting on how he looks much older and smaller than when he was alive, she already notices a smell emanating from the corpse. She is furious that the quarrel that killed Lord Tywin has been left in his stomach and orders it to be removed. Cersei wonders whether she should act desperate and claw her own face, as she heard Caitlyn Stark did when her son Rob was killed before her eyes, and wonders how Lord Tywin once received news of his own father's death. She commands that the bells must toll for her father, just as they did for King Robert. She asks for Pycelle and wants him to prepare the body, but is told Grand Maester has already been there and left again. This angers her more because of Pycelle's uselessness in old age and she calls for Maester's Balabar and Franken instead. Cersei asks about Jaime and is again told he's down in the secret passage, inspecting the depth of a shaft found there. She is worried about his safety thinking of his lost hand and how the murderer might await him in the dark. Kyburn is shown in, offering his service 
as Maester. He informs her that he treated Jaime's hand and she remembers that he came down from Harrenhal with her brother. She notices that he doesn't have a Maester's chain, receiving the answer that it has been taken away by the Citadel while his knowledge is still there. She orders him to remove the quarrel and prepare her father's body for the Silent Sisters. Kyburn asks her what he should do with the girl. Cersei has not noticed the second body in the bed before and takes a look at her naked body, observing the golden chain around her neck and that her face is as black as Joffrey's was when he died. She demands to know what the girl is doing here, receiving the unsatisfying answer that she has been found where she is and that she's Tyrion's whore. She thinks that Lord Tywin never used whores and defensively tells a guard how Tywin treated his own father's mistress after his death, parading her naked through the streets of Lannisport. Kyburn suggests that Lord Tywin might have been questioning the girl. Cersei eagerly seizes on this notion but has a vision of Tyrion mocking it. And what better way to question her than naked? She can't stand staying in the room any longer and goes back to the hall. Cersei finds her Osmond accompanied by his brothers Osni and Osford, and orders them to make certain that nobody will ever hear about the dead girl in her father's bed. Her body is disposed of by the Kettlebacks, and Cersei remembers the girl's name and that she came to her the night before Tyrion's trial by combat, asking that promises made to her by Tyrion and allegedly Cersei be kept, including a manse in the city and the knight to marry. Cersei made it clear that she would get nothing until she told them the whereabouts of Sansa Stark making her leave in tears. She orders the Kettlebacks to carry Shay's body through the secret passage, but wants to have the chain around her neck delivered to herself. As Sir Osfred is about to step into the tunnel, Jaime emerges from it. She rushes towards him, asking whether he has found the killers, but is told that the shaft ends in a chamber where half a dozen tunnels meet, some of them closed with locked iron gates, and Jaime needs to find keys first. He suggests that the killers could still be hiding in the maze he just left. Cersei again envisions Tyrion climbing through the walls like some monstrous rat. She says she wants the murderers found and the whole tower to be demolished if need be. Jaime hugs her to console her and she has a rush of desire for him. She whispers in his ear, asking him to take over as Hand of the King to complete their father's work. But he pushes her away, declines the offer, makes a joke about a hand without a hand, and says that she shouldn't ask him to rule. Cersei feels the rejection like a slap, realising that it has been noticed by everyone present, and that the whole castle will know soon. She angrily says that she didn't ask him to rule, as she is going to do that herself, as the Queen Regent, until Tommen comes of age. Jaime replies that he doesn't know whom to feel worse for, Tommen or the Seven Kingdoms. She slaps him. They are both admonished by Sir Kevin to take their indecent behaviour out of the room where their father's body lies. Jamie apologises for his sister, pointing out that she is forgetting herself while grief-stricken. This makes Cersei want to slap him again and regret her impulse to ask him. She wonders whether to abolish the position of hand altogether, remembering how John Arryn and Eddard Stark meddled in her affairs, the latter forcing her to get rid of King Robert before she could deal with his brothers, and how Tyrion sold Marcilla to Dawn, made Tommen a hostage and killed Joffrey. Cersei settles on her uncle Kevin as the next hand, as she considers him loyal and prudent while unambitious to challenge her as the real power behind the Iron Throne. She thinks that she needs men supporting her and that the current small council will not do. With Grand Maester Pycelle too old and Lord Mace Tyrell and his bannermen, Lord Paxter Redwyn and Lord Mathis Rowan not to be trusted. She also can't rely on Jaime, who has lost his courage with his hand. She again considers the possibility the Tyrells were involved in the murder, as Lord Mace must have known he can never rule the Seven Kingdoms as long as Tywin Lannister is alive. However, she realises she has to proceed carefully against the Tyrells, with the city full of their men and Loras Tyrell, now a knight of the Kingsguard. The thought of the engagement of Tommen and Marjorie Tyrell still makes her furious, and she questions Marjorie's virginity. Cersei intends to use Varys to find out more on this front. The thought of Varys makes Cersei aware that the eunuch isn't present, 
while he is usually around when something important happens in the Red Keep. The only explanation for his absence is that he was involved in the plot, preempting his own downfall as Lord Tywin never had any love for him. She thinks that Varys might have known about the secret passage and acted on behalf of Stannis. She orders Sir Merin to find the Master of Whisperers and bring him to her. Sir Boris returns red-faced and puffing, announcing that Tyrion is gone, his cell open with no sign of him anywhere. Cersei is appalled, thinking her nightmares are coming true. She points out her orders to keep the imp under guard day and night. So Boris says that a jailer called Rugen has gone missing while two others were found asleep. She orders for them to be killed. Cersei's paranoia of Tyrion breaks out fully and reflects that he has already killed her mother, her father and her eldest son and will try to murder her too. Remembering the prophecy she once received about her little brother killing her. She gets queasy and Sir Boris tries to sustain her, but she recoils from his touch, thinking he might be one of Tyrion's creatures. She envisions Tyrion grinning at her, feeling his hands closing in around her neck the very moment she thought she was rid of him. Chapter 4 Brienne travels to Duskendale, seeking the whereabouts of Sansa as she was charged to do by Jaime. Having found few leads in King's Landing, Brienne asks nearly everyone she can along the roads and villages, but never mentions Sansa by name. Upon the road beyond Rosby, she comes upon a camp with Illifer the Penniless and Creighton Longbow, two hedge knights who offer to share their meal, mistaking her for a man at first. Sir Illifer later remarks on how Brienne bears a shield with the sigil of House Lothston, a disgraced family who once held Harrenhal. Brienne was given the shield by Sir Jamie, who had taken it from Harrenhal. When she tells the two that she lost her own shield, Illifer figures out by her size that she must be Brienne, murderess of King Renly. The Maid of Tarth denies having killed Renly, and the Hedge Knights agree to travel with her to Duskendale. After passing a large group of poor fellows, or sparrows, lowly holy men bound for King's Landing, bearing the bones of Septons killed around the Riverlands, they catch up to a merchant guarded by a couple of men and another hedge knight named Sir Shadrick. Joining forces along the dangerous road, Shadrick tells Brienne in private that he knows that the maid she seeks is Sansa Stark and that he seeks her as well, but for a purse of gold offered by Varys. Brienne is disturbed by the fact that the knight knew whom she was speaking of when describing Sansa's description to the merchants group. When the party stops at an inn, the old stone bridge for the night, Brienne slips off on her own, swearing to herself that she will not fail Jaime, having already failed King Renly and Lady Caitlin. Chapter 5 Down in the library beneath Castle Black, Sam is trying to find any information on the others for his Lord Commander, Jon Snow. Returning to the surface, Sam considers how hard Jon has been working the men of the Watch. He meets Dolores Ed, Pip, and Gren, and they mention how much Jon has changed, acting differently and barely spending any time with his friends, although he never misses a day practicing his sword work. We learn that Stannis has plans for Val, Dalla's sister, seeking to use her to forge an alliance between the Wildlings and the Northmen. Thus far, only the Car Starks, who have no other choice, have agreed to ally with Stannis. Sam arrives at John Sola, and John shows him a letter he plans to send to King Tommen, which declares that Stannis is aiding them in their battle, but the Night's Watch is not sworn to his cause. They discuss how Melisandre means to sacrifice Mance Radar for his king's blood. Jon states, Mance's blood is no more royal than mine own. He reveals to Sam that he is sending Gilly and the boy far away from the wall. Sam tells Jon that he has uncovered little on the others. But one book mentioned Dragonsteel swords as being effective against them. However, neither is sure if Dragonsteel and Valerian Steel are the same thing. Jon breaks the news that he is sending Sam to the Citadel so he can become a maester and replace Aemon. Sam will travel by sea from Eastwatch along with Gilly, the baby, and Maester Aemon. The thought of becoming a maester frightens Sam, bringing back memories of his father's wrath when he had mentioned training at the Citadel to him when he was a boy. His father had chained him by the neck in a cell and left him there for three days, 
telling him, no son of House Tali will ever wear a chain. Lastly, John commands Sam to never call himself Craven again. The next morning, as the party prepares to set off for Eastwatch, where they will join up with Darian, Gilly begs John to find a good wet nurse for the other baby. Chapter 6 Nearing Bravos by ship, Arya recalls how she originally wanted Captain Ternesio Terrace to sail for the wall. She had no such luck, but concluded the free cities would be a good place to land, considering that Sirio Forel came from Bravos and possibly Jack and Hagar as well. During the voyage, many of the sailors and even the captain have tried to get her to learn and remember their names, and many seem afraid of her. The captain's youngest son, Denyo, is telling Arya some of the history of Bravos and the titan that guards its port. The free city honors all gods and even has temples devoted to them, and was founded by the Moonsingers when they brought the people to Bravos to escape. The Dragons of Valeria. The Titan of Bravos is a massive statue and has arrow slits and murder holes strategically placed to attack any boat that tries to pass beneath without leave. Furthermore, the free city of Bravos is protected by the Arsenal, a massive fleet of ships and their fortified port. The captain has his oldest son, Yoko, row Arya to shore so as to get her off prior to customs coming aboard. As Yorko navigates the Hundred Isles of Bravos, he points out many of the sights before dropping her off at the quay in front of the House of Black and White. Arya disembarks, assuring Yorko that she will remember his name and enters the Temple of the Many-Faced God. Within, the temple is quite dark with dozens of odd statues. Arya notices several people in alcoves who are either dead or dying. Soon, a robed man with a kind voice tells her that the House of Black and White is a place of peace. He asks her name, but despite Arya's use of nicknames, the man keeps asking until she admits that she is Arya Stark. When the man asks if she fears death, Arya answers no. The man removes his cowl to reveal a decaying, horrible visage, but she sees through the illusion. Impressed, the kindly man asks if she's hungry, and Arya thinks, yes, but not for food. Chapter 7. Cersei arrives at the Great Sept of Baelor for Tywin's Wake, and is worried since Tommen seems to have a cold and the current High Septon was appointed by Tyrion. She wonders if she should have him removed. Tommen and Cersei both notice the stench that is emanating from her father's corpse. After the service, the procession of mourners come to offer condolences to Cersei. First is Felice Stokeworth, who mentions that her sister is ready to give birth and the family would like to name the child Tywin. Cersei is offended and brusquely forbids her. Next is Lancel, who is still looking half dead, professes his newfound faith. Cersei heads him off by saying, Atonement is best achieved through prayer. Silent prayer. The only mourner to please Cersei is Tania Merriweather, who promises that all her friends in the free cities have been notified to watch for and seize Tyrion. When Mace Tyrell comes before her, he mentions that his uncle Garth is on the way to assume the duties of Master of Coin. Cersei, not wishing to see another Tyrell on the small council, immediately backpedals that Guileless Rosby has already accepted the post. This upsets Tyrell and his mother, as Tywin had wanted Garth to assume the position. The Queen of Thorns then brings up the terrible smell in the Sept, and Cersei wants nothing more than to get rid of the clever old woman. But Lady Elena states she will not depart until Marjorie is wed to Tommen. Leaving the Sept, Cersei rides back to the Red Keep with Guileless Rosby, asking him belatedly to be her new master of coin, which he accepts. Back in her rooms, Kyburn pays her a visit, revealing that he discovered in the Under Jailer's sleeping cell a gold coin that dated back to the Gardener Kings of the Reach. Cersei again suspects the Tyrells had a hand in Tyrion's escape and Tywin's murder. Kyburn then asks if he may experiment on the dying Kregor Clegane in the Black Cells, since he is more adept at the nature of death than any of the maesters from the Citadel. Cersei agrees with his request, but tells him to bring her Kregor's head when he dies, as her father had promised it to Dawn. Finally, Kevin meets with her for dinner, as she had requested. Cersei asks him to be Tommen's hand, 
Kevin first admonishes her for making Mace Tyrell look a fool in front of half the court. He then informs her that he would rather help his son, Lancel, take control of Castle Derry. He offers to take up the position as hand, provided Cersei removes herself from King's Landing and returns to Castle Rock. Cersei is infuriated, and a fierce argument takes place during which she threatens Kevin. Unfazed, Kevin counters her to name Randall Tarly or Mathis Rowan as Tommen's hand. As both men are Tyrell vassals, she could drive a wedge between them and Highgarden. But the suggestion makes her even more angry and she accuses him of abandoning Tommen. As he departs, Kevin reveals that he knows who Tommen's father really is. Chapter 8 Standing a planned seven day vigil over his father's funeral bear, Jamie finds himself with a lot of time for thinking. He feels that he is as much to blame for his father's death as Tyrion or Varys. He also finds himself wondering what happened to the eunuch. His thoughts then turn to the day that Prince Rhaegar rode for the trident. Jaime had begged not to be left behind to guard the king, but Rhaegar told him that Ares feared Lord Tywin more than he did Robert, and he meant to keep Jaime at his side as insurance. Mounting up, Rhaegar's last words to Jaime were, when this battle's done, I mean to call a council. Changes will be made. I meant to do it long ago. But, well, it does no good to speak of roads. Not taken. Finally, Jamie recalls his recent questioning of the chief under jailer, which was a complete farce as Jamie knew far more than the man did, since he helped facilitate Tyrion's escape. When Jamie learned that the two jailers who were put to sleep were killed by Boris Blunt, and Osmond Kettleblack, he reprimanded them, warning them never to act on his sister's orders to kill anyone without consulting him first. Sometime in the middle of the night, Cersei visits him with the news of Kevin's refusal to becoming her hand, as well as remarking that Kevin knows about their relationship. She implores Jaime to reconsider being hand, but Jaime rejects her again. She departs with, very well, if it is a battlefield you want, battlefields I shall give you. Next morning, the mourners arrive anew, but the smell is so nauseating that Tommen gets sick. Jamie takes him outside to console him, advising him to go away inside, something Tommen understands from when Joffrey would torment him. Cersei then joins them, as does Mace Tyrell, and Jamie asks the Lord of Highgarden to have dinner with his sister. When Mace departs, Jamie tells Cersei to get the wedding over with and then send Lord Mace to besiege Storm's End once again. Cersei likes the idea, hoping Tyrell might lose his life this time. Chapter 9, Brienne Reaches Duskendale. She finds the gates barred for the night. The area surrounding it is littered with corpses of both Northmen and men from the Reach. The gates open at morning, and the captain tells Brienne that his sister can paint over the Black Bat of Lothston on her shield. After finding and telling the sister what sigil she wants, Brienne heads to the Dunfort to speak to the Lord. Since Lord Riker is in the field, she meets with the Castellan, Sir Rufus Leek and a maester who tells her that many came before her, asking if Dantas Hollard and Sansa Stark had come to Duskendale. The Dun's Fort's maester tells the story of the defiance of Duskendale, which seems to have been the incident that finally sent King Ares over the edge either of his own initiative or from the urgings of his wife, Sorella. Denny's Darklin took Ares hostage. When Tywin Lannister, who was Hand, surrounded the Dunfort, Lord Darklin threatened to kill Ares. When Ares was captured, Simon Hollard killed one of his Kingsguard, Sir Gaiwin Gaunt. After Barristan the Bold slipped into the Dunfort and rescued the king, Ares had nearly every member of the Darklin and Hollard families killed or attained. Dontos, who was young at the time, survived because Barrison asked Ares to stay his hand. The Castellan tells Brienne that Duxendale would have been the last place Dontos would have fled to. Despairing that she will never find Sansa, Brienne bumps into a skinny boy whom she also saw back at Rosby on a piebald Rosny, but he runs away. Visiting the Seven Swords Inn for dinner, Brienne meets a pious dwarf who tells her that he overheard a man called Nimble Dick 
in Maidenpool, bragging that he had fooled a fool, seeking passage for three across the narrow sea. That night, Brienne dreams of Renly's death, but when he topples after the shadow killed him, the body is that of Jaime. The next day, Brienne picks up her shield, painted with the sigil that Tansil had painted for Sir Duncan the Tall. Proceeding past fishing villages on the way to Maidenpool, Brienne camps by the ruins of the Hollard Castle and hears a rider. Fearing it may be Sir Shadrick and that a battle might ensue, she discovers the boy who seems to be stalking her. It turns out to be Podrick Payne who asks to stay with her, hoping if she finds Sansa, it may lead the boy back to Tyrion. Chapter 10. Marillion is singing day and night. Because his cell is open, his songs can be heard throughout the castle. Although Marillion has a beautiful voice, Sansa does not like the sound of his singing. She asks Peter if he cannot silence the singer. Littlefinger explains to Sansa that they need Marillion. With some persuasion, Marillion has confessed to the murder of Lysa. In return for his confession, Littlefinger has spared his life and his voice. Peter tells Sansa she has to cooperate. Marillion's confession. Sansa knows that Marillion did not murder Lysa and therefore hesitates. She has no pity for the singer as he has tried to rape her, but she is afraid that people will see through her lies. The next day, Nestor Royce and his son arrive at the Eyrie to investigate the murder of Lysa Arryn. Although she is afraid, Sansa tells the Royces that Marillion killed Lysa Arryn. Her fright and tears only make her more convincing. Then Marillion is let in. He confesses that he killed his mistress because he could not bear the thought of seeing her married to Peter. The Royces never liked Marillion and seem not to question his confession. They agree that Marillion will be confined to the sky cells. Eventually he will fall or jump to his death. Nestor then informs Peter that his cousin is gathering other lords to have Peter removed as Lord Protector of the Vale. Littlefinger already knows this and is unconcerned. As a reward for his services, he presents Nestor with a grant that makes him and his descendants hereditary lords of the Gates of the Moon. The Gates of the Moon are a secondary castle that has always been in the possession of the main Aryan line. Nestor has been appointed Castellan, but now acquires the castle in his own right. According to Peter, Lysa had decided to give the castle to Nestor, but was murdered before she could sign the order. When Nestor Royce and his son leave, Littlefinger explains to Sansa that Nestor will now be on his side. If Peter is removed as Lord Protector, the grant for the castle will be challenged because it was signed by Peter and not by Robert. That night, when Sansa goes to sleep, Robert creeps into her bed as he has been doing since his mother died. He asks Sansa if she is his mother now. Sansa says yes because she knows this lie will soothe him. Chapter 11. Arsha is at Ten Towers waiting for her supporters to arrive. The feast is almost over. There are many Harlors in the hole, but not enough of the other houses. Arsha knows she lacks support. She tells Three Tooth to find food for her crew and her prisoners. Then she goes to her uncle Roderick Harlor, Lord of Harlor. She finds him in the book tower, reading. Roderick's love for his books has earned him the nickname, The Reader. In Arsha's name, Roderick has sent summons to the captains to gather at Ten Towers. The captain of Harlor have come, but few others. Roderick informs Arsha that Aaron Greyjoy has called for a king's moot, an assembly of all captains to choose the king. Roderick assures Arsha that her cause is hopeless since no woman has ever ruled the Ironborn. Even Roderick's support does not mean his vassals will support her. Their fealty is for war purposes only. In a king's moot, they are allowed to vote as they please. Roderick counsels Arsha to stay away from the king's moot on Oldwick. Besides her lack of support, he is afraid that Euron Greyjoy will kill his competitors. Roderick offers to give her 10 towers instead. His heir, Harris Harlow, does not need ten towers and will protect her. Arsha declines the offer and walks back to the hall. She encounters Tristopher Botley on the way. When they were young, Triss was in love with Arsha. She liked him in the beginning, but became bored with him. 
and was glad when he was sent away. Christopher, though, has never forgotten her and wants to wed Asha. He is the legitimate lord of House Botley, since Sorwin Botley, his father, has been killed by Euron for refuting his claim to the throne. His titles have been given to Christopher's uncle, who supported Euron. Asha sharply refuses Christopher's advances by reminding him that they are not children anymore and that she is his queen, not his wife. Chapter 12. Cersei is regretting her concession to the Queen of Thorns to allow Tommen and Marjorie to sleep in the same bed on their wedding night only. When Jaime arrives to speak to her, he asks if she still means to burn down the Tower of the Hand after the wedding, but she is determined to see it destroyed and hopefully smoke out a few rats in the process. We begin to notice changes in Cersei, including weight gain and overindulgence in alcohol. Tommen's wedding is a modest affair compared to his brother's, and the ceremony goes over well enough. Afterwards, Kevin comes over to Cersei and mentions that Sandor Clegane is reported to have joined Beric Dondarrion's outlaws. The Queen is already aware of this, having heard that outlaws have pillaged salt pans and savagely raped townswomen. The reports mentioned that they were led by a huge man in a hound's head helmet. Cersei suggests that Lance will hunt down the hound, but her uncle scoffs that his son is not the man to deal with Clegane. When she then suggests that he go after Clegane himself, Sir Kevin responds curtly, When a dog goes bad, the fault lies with its master. Talking to Jaime, she wonders if Marjorie is really a maiden, and he tells her that Mace Tyrell will be marching on Storm's End in a few days, while Garland Tyrell will take half the Tyrell host to Brightwater Keep, and then on to Highgarden including Lady Allery Tyrell and Lady Elena. During the reception, Cersei recalls her visit to a woods witch when she was younger, and the old hag's words, Queen, you shall be, until there comes another, younger and more beautiful, to cast you down and take all you hold dear. Drinking heavily during the feast, she begins to wonder if Marjorie is the one in the hag's prophecy, which also mentions the Balancla. When Tommen chokes on his wine accidentally, Cersei flees the hall for some air. She is met outside by Lady Tanya, who informs her that one of Cersei's maids is a spy reporting to Marjorie's cousins. Cersei assumes it is Sinel and promises to reward Lady Merryweather if this is true, asking why the beauty from Maya would reveal this to her. Tanya responds that she wants what is best for her husband and son and Cersei could provide advancement for her family. Back inside, Cersei refuses to dance with anyone, but takes note of the attractive bastard of Driftmark, Orain Waters, with silvery hair, a mark of House Valerian, which is descended from the freehold of Valyria, like the Targaryens. He almost resembles Prince Rhaegar. Toward the end of the night, Cersei leads everyone outside to watch as the pyromancers set the Tower of the Hand on fire. As the green flames of wildfire consume the tower, the Queen Regent compares the beauty of the spectacle to Joffrey. As the others begin to depart for bed, Cersei remains behind to watch the fires burn, arm in arm with Sir Osmond Kettleblack. Chapter 13 Slipping through the shadow city of Sunspear during the night for a rendezvous with Princess Ariana, Sir Aerys Oakart considers how unlikely it is for an Oakart to even be in Dawn. Hailing from the Reach, the Oakarts have long been enemies of Dawn. The Kingsguard Knight left Marsilia playing Syvas with Prince Tristane, and under the protection of the Prince's sworn shield, Sir Gascoigne. Ares recalls his recent meeting with Prince Doran, who advised him that Marsilla would be safer at the Water Gardens. All her guards and Sir Ares would accompany them there, but Doran asked him not to write to King's Landing about the move. When he arrives to meet Ariana, he swears he'll do no more than tell her it has to end, but her nakedness overwhelms him. After their passion is stated, Ares is once again consumed by guilt, but Ariana has a response for every one of his doubts. The knight feels he has dishonored himself enough already. Ariana reminds him that he told her he loved her. Ares responds that he swore a vow. However, Ariana brings up several Kingsguard who broke their vows most famously Lucamore, the Lutzi, and Terence Toyne. 
and even Prince Aemon the Dragon Knight, though Sir Ares doesn't believe the latter story. She finishes with, It is not our love that dishonoured you. It is the monsters you have served and the brutes you called your brothers. When Ares tells her that King Robert was no monster, he can't help but think that she is right about Joffrey. Although he considers Tommen to be Joffrey's opposite, he can't disagree with Ariana's persuasive words that Marcilla would be a better ruler. They talk about Christian Cole, the Kingmaker, Lord Commander of Viserys First Kingsguard. At the time of Viserys' death, Sir Cole convinced Varys' son, Aegon II, to claim the throne. This led to the war between Aegon and his elder sister, Rhaenyra, whom Viserys had long groomed as his successor. Ariana reminds Ares that in Dawn, the eldest child rules, and had it not been for Christian Cole, Targaryen's inheritance might have been rewritten. She then explains to him the real reason that Marcella is being moved to the Water Gardens, to keep her away from those who seek to crown her. Ares tells her that the Water Gardens are not a prison, but she warns him that Hotar will see that Marcilla does not leave, claiming he is terrible when aroused. Still unable to convince Ares that her suggestions are correct, Ariana hugs him and begins to tremble. Once again, she manipulates him by asserting that if the Sand Snakes can be imprisoned for wanting to crown Marcilla, she could too. She mentions that there are no secrets between Tyene and herself, and then she tells him her father has never considered her worthy. Prince Doran tried several times to marry her off to old men of high birth, and when she was 14, she discovered a letter her father had written to her brother, Quintin, a ward of Lord Anders Yorinwood for years. In the letter, Doran wrote, One day you will sit where I sit and rule all of Dawn, and a ruler must be strong of mind and body. So Ares argues that this couldn't be true, but when she asks him where Prince Quintin is now, and his response is with Lord Anders Ironwood in the Boneway, Ariana tells him that is what her father wants everyone to believe. She has gotten word from some of her friends that Quinton is across the narrow sea. And she is sure that he is hiring the Golden Company, who recently broke their contract with Mia. The Golden Company has never broken their word since Bitter Steel reformed them nearly a hundred years ago. And since most of their members are exiles, the only reason they would change allegiance would be to return home to Westeros. And Anders Ironwood's ancestors fought in three of the Blackfire Rebellions, a fact that convinces Ariana that he seeks to crown Quinton as the next Prince of Dawn. Ariana's final persuasive words are, so your two princesses share a common cause, sir, and they share as well a knight who claims to love them both, but will not fight for them. So Ares then swears to defend Marsilia's right to rule and to protect Ariana from anyone seeking to steal her birthright. When he asks her what she would have of him, Ariana purrs, all, all my love, my sweet love, and forever. But first, Marsilia. Chapter 14, Drawing Near Maidenpool. Pod Payne can't seem to remember if Brienne is a knight or a lady. Frequently calling her, my lady, sir. Brienne has taken up his training, abandoned since Aaron Santagar was killed by the mob in King's Landing. They soon come up upon a farmer, his wife, and their cart of eggs bound for Maidenpool. As they ride together, the farmer tells Brienne that the town has been mostly rebuilt thanks to the hard hand of Randall Tarly. The maid of Tarth hopes she can slip through town without encountering the Lord of Hornhill, as she owes him a debt but bears no liking for him. At Maidenpool's gates, the captain informs the farmer that he will take his eggs and wife forcing Brienne to draw her sword. Outnumbered by the gate guards, she is spared fighting by the appearance of Hyle Hunt, a knight highly placed in Lord Tarly's army, and a man whom Brienne despises. Hunt begins to mock her, and Brienne warns him that she will sort him out in a melee someday, just as she did Red Ronnet Connington during the melee at Ashford. She asks him the location of the stinking goose, but Sir Hyle takes her to see Lord Randall first. The commander of Mace Tyrell's vanguard is dispensing his harsh brand of justice when they come upon him. When she is brought before him, Lord Tarly asks her if she killed Renly, 
and then states he should ship her back to Tarth. But Brienne reveals the king's document that Jaime has given her, and she informs Tali that she is seeking Sansa. He responds that Sansa is not in Maidenpool, nor would she be in the Vale, as Brienne has also assumed, since Lysa Arryn is dead. Brienne is shocked to learn that Sansa's aunt is dead. She heads off to the tavern, sending Sir Hyle off when he attempts to apologise for his actions at Highgarden. Later, awaiting the arrival of Nimble Dick at the Stinking Goose, she recalls the hurtful game Hyle and his friends played at her expense. Brienne had gone to Highgarden to answer Renly Baratheon's call to banners, expecting to be ridiculed, but unbelievably, many of the young knights she met, Big Ben Bushy, Edmund Ambrose, Red Ronnet Cunnington, Hugh Beesberry, Richard Farrow, Owen Itchfield, Mark Mullendore, and Hyle Hunt were exceedingly kind to her, going above and beyond the others to win her favour. Wary of their intentions, Brienne was still vulnerable, thanks to Hope, but she soon learned the truth. Randall Tarly called her before him to reveal what he had learned of their game through his son Dickon. The knights involved had a burgeoning wager on who could claim her maidenhead. Tali ended their game, but told her that the fault lay with herself, claiming her being here encouraged them and that a war host is no place for a maiden. When Dick Crab finally arrives, Brienne offers to buy him drinks. Nimble Dick soon launches into his story, egged on by a steady bribe from Brienne. He explains how he offered to help a fool make it across the narrow sea. The fool claimed he had two girls with him, but couldn't chance the ports in Maidenpool. So Dick took his coin and took him and the girls along the shore to an old, now unused smuggler's cove. Up past Crackmore Point, Nimble Dick agrees to take her there for a large sum of coin, pointing out that he is from the area and warns Brienne of the Whispers, a keep built by a mythical ancestor of his, Sir Clarence Crabbe. Chapter 15 Sam is trying his best to keep both Gilly and himself calm. During the tumultuous sea trip to Bravos, the Night's Watch ship Blackbird will take them only so far as Bravos, and then Sam will need to find Tender there bound for Old Town. Sam is hopeful that the others making the journey with him will find happiness when they reach their destination. Gilly and the Babe at Horn Hill, Maester Aemon back at the Citadel, and Darien in his new role as a recruiter. The old maester tells them the story of his sea trip to the Wall, how he travelled with Lord Commander Sir Duncan the Tall as his honour guard, along with Brendan Rivers, Lord Bloodraven himself, who was sent by Egg to serve out the remainder of his life in the Watch. As the trip progresses, Sam finds that nothing he says can console Gilly, and that Maester Aemon's health deteriorates. Damon has nothing but scorn for the wildling girl, but Eamon tells Sam to look closely at the baby to find the source of Gilly's grief. When Sam realises that the baby is actually Dala and Mance Raiders, not her own, he can't believe what John did. Maester Eamon states, What threats the Lord Commander made, what promises I can only guess. And while Sam understands that John did so to save the baby from Melisandre's fires, he remains shocked at what cost this will have for Gilly. Anyway, we'll probably stop there and make this part one of three of A Feast for Crows Explained. In the next video, we'll continue from chapter 16 to 30 for part two. If you can think of anything we missed, please comment below. Also, check out our playlist of A Song of Ice and Fire Explained. Also, when you get the chance, try out Fantasy Flights, a Game of Thrones board game, digital edition.